back and good evening and welcome to the Rural Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Dr Lucy Ingram and tonight's case is on dementia presentations in rural general practice. Discussing our case tonight, we have Dr Nassal Ganga, um, Staff Specialist Geriatrician in Medicine at Toowoomba Hospital. Can we all welcome Dr Nassal? We also have uh, Dr Cathy James, she's a general practitioner and medical educator. Can we all welcome Dr Cathy James? <laughs> and we also have Stephen Gordon, um, a senior psychologist, uh, geriatric and rehabilitation service um, at Toowoomba Base Hospital. Um, thank you, welcome. Thank you. Um, as usual, we're being live streamed around Australia and we have a number of participants watching remotely. So I encourage you to join the discussion by emailing your questions to media at qrme.org.au or you can use the hashtag on your screen now. Our presenter for tonight is Dr Stuart Glastonbury uh, from the Clifton Medical Practice and Hospital Cooperative and he's presenting an interesting case on dementia in general practice. Please put your hands together for Stuart. Okay, um, thanks Lucy and, and thanks to the expert panel tonight. So, um, all right, so this is a, a case um, around dementia. Um, <coughs> I'll start off with just a bit of the case history. So, uh, this is Mr MK, he's a 69 uh, year old male, uh, lives in a small rural town. Um, and he presented to, to myself um, in, in the clinic with his daughter. Um, and his daughter was kind of concerned about memory loss and a bit of unusual behaviour. Um, it, it was a bit, it was kind of a bit uncertain as to how long this had been going on for. His, his daughter didn't actually, it doesn't live in the same town. In fact, lives quite a distance away um, uh, from him. And so it was a bit vague about the kind of the, the, the story about how long this had been going on for. Um, but there was a sense or a suggestion that this was probably over the last six months. Um, she had noted that some of his friends had been noticing um, that he'd had some odd behaviour um, and um, on further questioning of that, there wasn't any sort of specific things, perhaps maybe a bit of um, uh, uh, sort of maybe a bit of social isolation, a bit of uncomfortable conversation where it just went off on very strange tangents um, and um, enough to make his friends just feel a little bit uncomfortable about, mm, gee, what's going on here? Maybe there's a few alarm bells um, early on ringing there. Um, so there was also a suggestion that there was worsening depression as well. Um, and he did have some word finding um, difficulties as well. So again, nothing particular, but just sort of you know, stumbling over naming objects and a, a few other bits and pieces and things like that. So um, this was enough to make his daughter concerned um, to come quite a distance, as I said, to come and be with him. Um, and she had a busy, a busy life in the city where she lived. So she put a lot on hold to, to come up um, to be with him. So I guess for me that was a little bit of a warning thing that, that, that this was significant enough for, for a daughter to come, you know, a reasonable distance. Um, okay, so his past medical history then, he had treated primary syphilis at the age of 35. Um, he had uh, alcohol dependence for the majority of his adult life. Um, not so much of an issue now, although he liked to have a few beers with his mates still down at the pub, and that was pretty much on a daily basis. So um, there's there some dependence still sort of going on, but I guess not anywhere near as much as he did have um, when he was younger, I guess. Um, um, you know, he, he's got the usual kind of uh, um, group of other uh, comorbidities like hypertension, dyslipidemia. As I mentioned, he does have a history of depression and as I said before, that was worsening a little bit as well. Um, and he has, just to throw in on top there, he has some osteoarthritis at both knees. All right, so social history then. Um, he lives alone in, in a small home that, um, that he owns. Um, but as, as I said, his daughter was up with him now. He's on the pension. Um, he's divorced. Um, and as talked about already, some alcohol and also currently still smoking and a lifelong smoker. 
family history. Then uh, mother died of breast cancer. Um, I, I didn't get the age on that. Father died of an MI at age 70. Uh, brother, essentially unknown um, and not really part of the picture at all. Um, and the daughter as with him had, has no uh, particular health concerns. All right, so medications, um, he's on antidepressant medication, he's on blood pressure medication, he's on cholesterol medication, he's on Panadol Osteo for his osteoarthritis, um, and also some meloxicam, just uh, 15 milligrams daily, just as, as he needs. And he found that at least symptomatically that helped quite, uh, quite well with the um, knee pain. Um, and he had no, no known drug allergies. Okay, so physical exam at this point in time, at the first presentation, blood pressure was just only marginally raised systolic at 148 um, and on the, on the border at 90 for diastolic. Heart rate 86 regular, afebrile, heart sounds were dual, um, no added, no signs of heart failure um, and no carotid breweries either um, were appreciable. Um, chest, abdo, normal ish essentially cranial nerves upper and lower neuro um, I mean reasonably difficult to have a really good um, cra uh, uh, cranial nerve and and upper and lower uh, neuro examination in general practice within the time constraints but certainly on a gro on a gross sort of level they were they were okay there was there was nothing obvious um, speech and articulation was normal but slow uh, just I mean, I, I kind of thought maybe this is just a, a kind of a country bloke sort of slow drawl, but, um, but um, hard, hard to, de to, to determine within the context of this case. Um, and his coordination was grossly normal as well. All right, so basic first line investigations, uh, full blood, there's nothing, um, nothing remarkable there. Uh, ELFT also nothing remarkable. Um, B12 and folate um, was within the normal range. A fasting glucose and a fasting lipids um, were okay. So he was, lipids were well controlled um, on his Lipitor, I think it was what he's on. So in that first initial presentation, there's a lot of things going through my mind. And one of them is, geez, it's a long way to go for a head CT or an MRI. Um, and because um, at this point in time, I'm thinking, you know, is this an early dementia? Is this a dementia picture? And so um, I decided against that at this point in time. Um, all right, so he comes back though six weeks later with his daughter um, and he's had actually really significant deterioration. Now, I don't know whether this was significant deterioration or it's actually because his daughter was now living with him that it's actually being more picked up on, on what was going on. Um, increasing bizarre behaviour, weird kind of irrational speech, laughing at really odd times and some paranoia too that his daughter had, had noticed. Um, and he'd also been incontinent of urine a couple of times. So I got a quick urine MCS and that was at least on dipsticking uh, point of care testing was normal. Um, Memory loss as well was obviously part of it and he was having um, more and more difficulty uh, recalling recent events and those sorts of things. Um, all right, so the daughter at this point in time now was actually really concerned about his ability to stay at home. Um, so, so I guess at this point in time, I thought, you know, this is getting quite serious. The daughter was certainly concerned. Um, and we did start to talk about the idea of ACAT, Blue Care and other home help and the other services that we could get in the attempt to try and, you know, keep him at home and keep him in his familiar, familiar surrounds and those sorts of things. Um, However, the daughter uh, needed to go back to work. Um, so she'd been up for quite a while now and had had, had had a lot of time off. And she just was kind of desperate to have him admitted as a kind of a respite kind of um, for a care. So luckily there was a small local hospital um, and they were happy to have him um, basically um, into the, you know, in, in, into a nursing home type sort of situation. Okay, so MMSE at this point in time was 20. Um, and he'd lost points on orientation, he lost points on memory recall, and he lost points on writing a sentence as well. Um, all right, so um, now it's kind of in the hospital setting. Um, I was still in the general practice, but I was certainly keeping an eye on what was, what was going on there. Um, and the nursing sto uh, staff note continual rapid deterioration worsening bizarre behaviour and now actually reporting hallucinations. And the interesting thing about that when I actually did go and see him was that um, his dead brother, I think, was in the bed next to him. 
and he was having conversations with his dead brother. Um, so interesting conversations, I think, but nonetheless um, slightly, um, yeah, hallucinogenic. Um, OK, so also starting to show a bit of aggression as well um, and getting really frustrated and really angry, and he was started um, on some medication for that and also starting to show ataxia as well, um, so ri risking um, falls um, and uncoordination. Blood still remained unremarkable um, and he was actually at this point transferred for a head CT and it was just showed generalised age related atrophy. Um, the hospital uh, SMO decided on a lumbar puncture um, and did a lumbar puncture and that was normal. Um, so, um, which I assumed at that point was checking for tertiary syphilis. Um, so. Um, at this point in time, I, for, out of my own interest, I actually conducted another MMSE on him because this is, I, I was a junior doctor and I was interested in, in just following this up and seeing the deterioration over time and doing another MMSE. I could not do it. It was absolutely impossible. Like, there was no chance. This guy, when I started talking to him, he'd just laugh at me. He'd be talking to his dead brother. Um, there was just no chance that I could even remotely conduct any resemblance of an MMSE on this guy. And he died three weeks later. Later. Um, so that's a fairly rapid progression. What we know is six, six months and then we've got a, a, a period of about two, uh, a three, three or four months going on there since the kind of seen me and going into the hospital. So obviously his daughter was very upset about that. She came, um, she came back. So I left that area and I thought, geez, this was an interesting case. And um, I rang the SMO uh, three months later, and he'd had a, they'd sent for a brain biopsy and it came back CJD. Um, so it's, that's what she said to me anyway. She said that the, the results had, um, had come back as CJD. So that was a very interesting learning lesson for me, um, so, and one that came a little bit out of the blue. So anyway, that's the case. Um, if I could start um, by asking you, um, Nassal, about um, dementia presentations um, to general practice registrars. This was obviously a very rare sort of case in the end, um, but earlier on um, I'm sure that's a fairly common presenting scenario and I'd just like to know from a specialist perspective, um, you know, what um, sort of um, cases would you like to see referred on to specialist care, at what sort of stages, um, you know, that, that you would like to see them um, and, and sort of the work up that you would like them to have had before they reach your um, table. Yeah, yeah I think I, I agree and uh, this is a very rare, uh, in my experience uh, uh, in geriatric care and stroke care, uh, I've seen one CJD case for the last maybe 15 years. Mm. So it's very unlikely that you'll see more than three in your career. So this is a very unusual case, but what you will be seen very frequently though is much more common forms of uh, cognitive impairments and in, in uh, as Jason mentioned atrial fibrillation is going to be an epidemic in, in coming years because we, we tend to live longer. As we tend to live longer Alzheimer's disease is going to be our number one uh, medical issue as well in the future. Mm -hmm. Now the normal patient that would come to a general practice I would imagine the first question at least the, the, the patients who come to my clinic the, the majority of patients would have the initial, as the initial uh, presentation would be the memory impairment. The wife would say, I would speak to him and in five minutes time he would ask the same question from me again. Or else he would, uh, he would tell me the same question all over and over again. So memory impairment is, is usually the first sign in majority of patients. And however, it's very important to Remember, dementia is a, is a dreaded disease as well as it's a dreaded diagnosis to have. So we have to be very careful before we make in that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I, I see that when patients, there's evidence, compelling evidence to suggest if you have a dementia diagnosis on a, on a piece of paper coming with him, he gets substandard care in, in, in hospitals, substandard care elsewhere. So we are therefore, as general pr practitioners, as general uh, and specialists, we have to be very careful in making that mm. diagnosis. So memory impairment is only one part of the diagnosis of a dementia. And if somebody has memory impairment only, that actually do not qualify them to have dementia. They need to have a separate other 
specific categories for you to go along with memory impairment to categorize. In, there are main, four main categories. One is the language difficulties. They need to have some form of a, either expressing themselves or understanding language difficulties, either writing. Their writing should be getting worse and worse. Apraxias or dyspraxias, that means their power is fine, but they can't do a simple task. The wife would say he, he used to get dressed up within a minute or so, but now takes 15 minutes to get dressed. They get slower and slower. Or he would have trouble in planning the day. For instance, mm. if there's a, if they, even for coming into the appointment with you, he will struggle a lot to see how I'm going to do that. So planning and executing stuff. And ask the simple questions from that person. Whether he's able to do the simple tasks as, whether, he, whether your mom used to bake the same cake she used to bake mm. before, or whether she could do the banking that she used to do. Mm. We take on for granted going into calls and buying things is, is an easy thing, but that has a lot of complex tasks associated with it. So there are several other categories that should go with memory impairment to, to diagnose dementia. And therefore, that will be your first goal before you're going into any investigations to get a history. Uh, somebody told me as a neurologist or a geriatrician, what is the best equipment you should have? I think it's, it's important to have uh, uh, in, in, in general practice as well. It could be a pen and a, pen and a paper or the telephone, more than, a, more than your stethoscope or anything else. So get that history first and to find out whether they fall into a category of dementia. That's your first part. And that's what I would first do. And, and if, you, if, if you actually listen to this case, it's a bit atypical because he doesn't come with the memory impairment mm -hmm. to start off with. This gentleman coming with the atypical presentation where it is a behavioral problem to start off with. Mm -hmm. So it's not your typical Alzheimer's patient that, that is, unless the daughter had seen this father after t five, six years, and then coming and explaining. No, she, she'd seen him fairly regular that he, he'd, uh, half the year would sort of spend down with her and kind of half a year kind of go um, back up to his own home. Yeah. I think he followed the, the summer. Um, but um, but I, I, th I think that was the hardest thing that I found is that I guess it was atypical and I must admit that I, pro I didn't look at executive functioning and that was probably one of the areas that I didn't really look at. Um, you know, tried to look at speech and tried to look at memory and those things, but the executive functioning thing I, I didn't really pick up on um, and that you'd mentioned but um, you know I, I found it really difficult like I mean and, and, and I guess I don't know Kathy what you find but like it's really difficult when you've got that presentation of someone with like you know that isn't functioning at home or there's some concerns and some deterioration to actually like not catastrophize it and go, oh my God, you know, they've got Alzheimer's or, you know, whatever. And kind of, I, I think maybe I minimized everything too much in the beginning. I, I don't know what. what I think you? that, um, like Nisa said, the presentation is quite atypical. I've seen one case of um, this kind of dementia in 20 years of practice. And I guess the common presentations that I would see with dementia are really probably um, the person coming expressing themselves that they are noticing some change in memory. So very subtle changes and exactly that thing about not wanting to catastrophize and um, at the same time not wanting to minimize as well that sort of um, fine line that you take in terms of working with someone um, through the issues and I think if someone has genuine memory impairment um, you're dealing with quite a complex situation for that person they're dealing with maybe um, facing a, a pretty terrible diagnosis if it turns out to be dementia. Um, they're dealing with grief and loss about what they can see is happening for themselves. Mm -hmm. And also it's not really a diagnosis of one person, it's really the diagnosis of a family because mm -hmm. often it has a significant impact on you know, the carer and, and, and the the wider family. Um, so that's probably the commonest, um, rather than this kind of extreme presentation, I'd see that and then probably the spectrum through to people who um, develop more impairment with memory and function over time and then having to work with multidisciplinary teams to kind of manage the person's care because mostly people with memory loss and dementia can be cared for in a community setting and that's the preference for a lot of people to be managed uh, in a community. 
um, yeah. setting. If I can just yeah. pick up on that and ask mm. our um, panel psychologists um, your, your opinion and, and whether or not you engage with some of these patients um, or you would want to engage with some of these patients and their families um, when we're feeling like there's some um, cognitive impairment, perhaps mild cognitive impairment, heading towards a diagnosis of dementia mm. or perhaps once a diagnosis of dementia has been made and, mm. and um, what your experience is and if you can talk to the registrars about that. Yep. Um, I suppose the psychologist's role um, in terms of uh, the diagnostic phase is working out, well, is there a cognitive impairment? Um, is there actually a significant difference um, in their cognitive functioning? Um, so uh, where there's any query about that, um, you, know, you employ the use of standardised tests um, with nice normal distributions and you can actually try and make some judgments about um, whether they've actually had a, a, a significant decline in their cognitive function. So there's that objective um, measures that you can undertake. Uh, but what I'm finding invaluable is uh, uh, really good interviews with the significant carers or the significant other. So it's got to be someone who's had um, good recent longitudinal exposure uh, to that person. Um, and there's an instrument called the IQ code, um, which I utilise. I can't tell off the top of my head where I got it. Just Google it, it'll come. Um, but it asks, uh, there's a short and longer form, and uh, it asks specific areas of cognition and asks the carer to comment on, you know, where this person sits on these things compared to 10 years ago. I um, also try to do my settings in the home environment, so do my assessments in the home environment so you can, you can actually see what's going on in the home environment, because uh, there's often quite a number of clues as to how that person is going cognitively. Um, the other aspect to the role is uh, making sure there's not a confounding variable that's affecting cognition. So making sure there's not a mood disorder, you know, like depression or anxiety or stress. Um, uh, making sure that there's you know, no recent significant stresses or changes in the person's life, which they might be actually ruminating about, which, be, which, be, which would be affecting their attention and therefore would be affecting their, their memory. Um, uh, alcohol and drug usage, uh, asking questions about that and screening about that um, uh, without stepping on the medical arena, just uh, asking a few questions about how they manage the medications and how many medications they're actually taking and ask for some visible evidence of how they're doing that. So you're kind of looking for the, you know, is there a polypharmacology or mismedication management issue going on potentially at home? Uh, so it, as my role is trying to rule out, look, are there other variables that could be accounting for the change in cognition as well? Mm. I think there's a two-part aspect yeah. to that in terms of the ongoing care. Mm -hmm. um, also play a role in uh, providing compensatory strategies for that particular person. Um, so there's uh, you know, cognitive competence cognitive compensatory strategies you can engage in, like the use of diaries and scratch pads and reminders um, uh, and, and other useful systems which will help the person keep functioning as independently as they can. Um, education of the carer or significant other as well. Um, sometimes uh, the significant other might assume it's actually a personality issue or this person's become more belligerent or more of a pain in the butt and this person's ignoring me or not listening to anything I say. And it's more attributed to a personality issue. Um, and when there's some education around, well, look, it's actually um, a, a cognitive variable that's beyond that individual's control, um, then there's a greater level of empathy and, and, uh, and, and they can get some skills and some advice on, on, on how to navigate around that person and, and to help them and, and prop them up and help them as best as possible. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, can I just bring it back to uh, Nassau? Just wanting to ask about. Um, I know that this was um, an unusual presentation, but were there any red flags in this mm. presentation, or any that you would like registrars to be aware of in, in presentations of um, cognitive impairment, um, where you know sooner um, investigation mm. and referral should be triggered? Mm. Yeah. So this case, what is unusual is the, the progression of the disease. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you have Alzheimer's disease, uh, your average. Uh, uh, progression is about uh, they expect uh, depending on the on the life expectancy now if you have about uh, if the Alzheimer's disease starts at the age of 65 you are expected to live around say 10 to 12 years on that mm. if your Alzheimer's disease starts at the age of uh, 90 you are expected to live about three years mm. and uh, but uh, I uh, sorry uh, I, Robert, uh, what was the age of this patient 
you're around 70, 60, 60s. Yeah, yeah. 70 so long. So this remember. gentleman has deteriorated significantly. Yeah. Now, if, if somebody deteriorates with a cognitive impairment significantly, you have to think outside the box and see where this would be. CJD is one of them. Mm. And also you have to think of whether this is actually a tumor process or something space occupant yeah, yeah, that's yeah. going on as well. Mm. So, But you have done the CT scan as you Eventually. would do. Mm. Now, also, if somebody starts with uh, cognitive impairment with some extrapyramidal side, extrapyramidal effect, uh, some rigidity symptoms suggestive of Parkinsonism features, mm. and also tells you that I am seeing things. Mm. And actually, when you when you presented the case, some one of the things that I, that went into my mind was whether this could be a Lewy body disease. Mm. And uh, but what it was against was it is there wasn't any features suggestive of Parkinsonism disease. So your Alzheimer's disease, your vascular dementias, your dementia with Parkinson's disease mm. goes on for a longer period of time. And if somebody is deteriorating fast, there could be either. There could be a delirium process that's going on due to uh, something sinister happening. So you need to act fast. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, having said that, you've done really well in that setting, in a, in a remote setting, to get mm -hmm. a lumbar puncture. And, and, uh, and well, that was, that was yeah. done in the hospital, so yeah. they, they sort of took management of that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the red flag signs would be the deterioration. Rapid deterioration is against Alzheimer's disease. There should be a underlying process that's going on or whether the diagnosis you need to revisit the diagnosis when that happens and uh, and so often they're not now in case if you had diagnosed CJD to start off with mm. I'm afraid still the outcome would be the same yeah. you would have died on the same on on around the same time again because on mm. there's no treatment mm. as such but a tumor uh, something like a tumor if you diagnose that uh, certainly that can be curable that mm. would be a good outcome mm. Thank you for that. And if I can just pick up on that sort of survival theme, um, uh, th there's um, been sort of recent studies that have um, shown that um, early treatment with um, medications for Alzheimer's disease in early cognitive impairment haven't really prevented progression of the disease as some people had perhaps hoped. And I think um, there's a lot of pa uh, patient or carer push towards early treatment um, in the hope that it might sort of keep um, functioning for longer. Can you comment on that? Am I correct about that? Or um, what's sort of your approach to that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very important question. Now, mm. now I am stressing the fact that I am touching on Alzheimer's disease here because mm. that's where the evidence is based yeah. on, uh, on co uh, the medication, especially cholinesterase inhibitors. Now, the, as I said, if somebody comes in with just a short-term memory loss without any executive functioning mm. loss, that, that is diagnosed as mild cognitive impairment or MCI, of, I, we call it mag, uh, MCI of amnestic type. And that's a very early stage of cognitive impairment. In fact, it's not dementia, it's a risk factor for dementia. Mm. And if, if, if a person is asking for a medication, just based on that, it's too early to treat at that mm. point of time. I always give them a six months appointment to, or six, a three months appointment to come and review again and do an assessment probably I would ask Steve to do another assessment as he had done before to see whether there's any decline. But what you should be careful is who you are dealing with as the patient. Now, I was trained in Oxford, and there, north part of Oxford, if a memory patient comes from the north part of Oxford, that's where the, all the academics live. And there are professors in, uh, uh, in, in uh, various specialties. For their MMSC to get to 28, they have to be damn uh, demented before they do that. <laughs> they are. Yeah, and and on the other on the other hand, just seven eight kilometers away, uh, in a in an area called Didcot, where there's a socio-economic background is quite low, and they, they the maximum age they go into about nine to eight ten years of age they go to. And, and they come in with very subtle cognitive impairment with the MMSC of six or seven. <laughs> because they can't calculate, they can't do anything. Mm. So your simple MMSC itself would not give the diagnosis. Yeah. My, my best cognitive assessment is having that five to 10 minutes speaking with the family and the carer that lived with that patient throughout mm. their life. That's your best assessment of the cognition than any of these 
fancy brain imaging or what these tests would do. That will only complement. We should, we should find out. We should always imagine dementia is a clinical diagnosis. It doesn't di get diagnosed mm. with a blood test or any of these imaging techniques. So the, the way to find out is, is to is to get the uh, patients to spoken to the families. Now, whether when we start the, the medication on, if the family tells, my father was such a high flying person before, he was, for, he was functioning quite a high level, he's not doing anything that he was doing before. You are, even before your MMSC, even if your MMSC is 29, 30, and if there's suggestion that mm. he's still struggling with some mm. of the executive tasks, I would start the medication. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Now, there has been, even in some countries, even here, we had to stick to MMSC to start on it, but you have to cater according to the patient and, and see. Whereas, if a patient, as Steve said, who has bere bereaved, uh, bereavement from the husband has just died and just moved house, and who has just uh, uh, gone to school until the age of 13, coming with a not concentrating on much and not remembering much, with a MMSC of 20, I'll take that with a pinch of salt, and then <laughs> get more information and find out and probably treat and get the patient to Steve to work with in regarding some uh, strategies and then assess this patient again before starting on it. So there's no right or wrong answer. I can't give a number to mm -hmm. tell you this is the number you need to start. You need to cater accordingly. Having said that, cholinesterase inhibitors are well recognized. They are, they, the myth is that it will not reverse the process. It will give you maybe one or two years. Mm. And you have to choose what is the best time to use that two years, mm -hmm. whether it's down the line or mm -hmm. use it now. It's a, it's a lottery given to us to get get few years ahead. And with when is the best time is to use. It's a, it's a, it's a personal preference. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, while we're talking on medications, if I can throw you a bit of a curveball, there's been a lot of popular press at the moment about um, statins mm. and an association with um, Alzheimer's disease. Mm. And um, I think a lot of the patients that are looking you know, or starting to have um, cognitive impairment are, are vascular paths. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Is this just a, a um, new hoopla or is there some good science behind <laughs> that? And um, is there a real risk in our, in our high use of statins in our society of... of uh, you know, vascular paths. Yeah, it's a statin is a very hot topic these days, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, look, there statins have shown, uh, if you actually look at the up to date, and there is study is done on statins that have actually benefited even Alzheimer's patients, not just vascular dementia. Mm. And I'm very skeptical about the, the the data going on on statins at the moment. And I'm uh, I really hope that they would not show that part two of the program that they are going to show. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the, the, it's a, I don't think there is a randomized control mega trial done or mega analysis uh, uh, done at, the time, at this point of time to say that they are adversely effective or they are actually of much benefit mm -hmm. at this moment of time. And more often than not, most of the dementia patient also has vascular, other vascular risk factors mm -hmm. like cardiac disease, ischemic heart disease, who had myocardial infarctions once or twice, mm -hmm. or peripheral vascular disease. And stopping a statin based on that, on, on, on a very subtle evidence, can have a catastrophic, uh, mm -hmm. uh, catastrophic um, result as a result of that. And I would not probably take that as a reason to stop statins. Oh, yeah. Nisal, I just wondered, um, yeah. I, sorry, Jason, just one sec. Just on that then, I now work in a, um, in a very elderly population and a lot of nursing home where you might have, you know, the 92-year-old woman who's essentially basically bed-bound or chair-bound um, and who has dementia um, and is on a statin. So let's flip it a little bit and say, like, at that point in time, then when do you kind of... And I don't want to draw... I don't want to keep on the statin thing, but it's just relevant at the moment yeah. um, to sort of go, well, when, when's it... Well, maybe enough's enough, you know, and, I, you know, yeah. Usually statin is beneficial if you were to say that they've got a good five-year survival rate mm. ahead. Okay. Now, the problem with statins are these were trialled on group of people 
who they thought the best benefit would come. Unfortunately, as geriatrician, uh, what I always moan is, my cohort of patients are not included in most of these trials. Mm. So you never know in a nursing home at, a, uh, at, at the age of 92, what the benefit these patients mm. are going to have. Okay. And in that scenario, if there's no ischemic heart disease, or if yep. the pay, and, and this was just started because the cholesterol was 5.2, yep. five years ago, yeah, yeah. That's a very sensible decision to stop okay. it. Yeah, in, in, to that matter, you don't need to have dementia to stop a statin for okay. a patient who's in a nursing home. And I myself uh, re and visited a few nursing homes recently. I myself have stopped a few statins. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you have to always tell you that with what risk and the benefit the patient yep. is going to have. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if we can cut to Jason. Yeah, sorry to interject, but um, I, I think that's a really important point, Lucy, and I think we have to be clear about it. So there's no evidence that statins cause dementia, and anyone who says that they do is either misinformed or misrepresenting the evidence. The FDA warning specifically um, uh, quoted um, mild reversible cognitive impairment uh, related to statin therapy. So that's all the trials or the, the meta-analyses have shown. Mm. Uh, it's mild reversible cognitive impairment and it re resolves when you stop the statin. They're not associated with dementia. So I think that's a really important message that we as health practitioners need to get out into the community, you know, to counteract the misinformation um, that, that, you know, some uh, quarters have, um, have publicised. Mm. Thank you. And um, if I can throw it to, to our general practitioner um, and perhaps as well to our psychologist, how do you guys manage um, this um, uh, patient and uh, relative anxiety and um, uh, you know, concern when they come in from, from hearing things in the popular media that, that may be sort of misinformation and, and obviously they're worried about their treatment and they're adamant that they're going to stop? You know, how, how do you kind of um, approach that just uh, to help our registrars who may be faced with this sort mm. of thing and may not be quite confident yet? Um, in, in uh, talking people over? Um, well, I think it's a bit um, in terms of looking at why people were on it in the first place. Um, it, was it justified to start off with? Um, sometimes people are on it for rather spurious reasons. Um, if there are risk factors in which they would benefit from it, um, I'd encourage them to stay on it and I'd give them the information, you know, for them to go away and read. But ultimately, it's their decision, you know, what they do. And I think as long as they have the good information, um, they can make an informed decision. I think there have been studies that actually for the people that you prescribe on statins, probably I think less than 50% actually continue on it anyway. So it's a bit of a, a, a battle sometimes to get people, you know, to stay on medication. But I think if people have had previous stroke, um, previous heart attack, mm. I'd be saying to them, look, we know that staying on, you know, low-dose aspirin or uh, andostatin reduces the risk of further heart attack or stroke by around 50%. So the odds are good. Mm. Mm. Uh, actually, just to take, take up on that point as well then, just to go off the satin thing, but then Nassal or, or Jason or, or, or anyone, I guess, as well, is that um, they're all on fish oil. So is, is, is there... Is there something in the, in the literature around fish oil and, and, and Alzheimer's or omega-3 essential fatty acids and those sorts of things? I mean, no, they've got a problem, but, it, you know, I just wondered, because often that's a question you, that I get as well. Yeah. yeah. Fish oil, again, has been studied and, uh, on, uh, on patients with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it's, again, not a huge trial that they have done on fish, fish oil. On, on, on a smaller trials that they have done, they have shown some benefit. Mm -hmm. Now, they, again, as with statins, the latest... Uh, uh, argument is that this this causes prostate cancer, and uh, and again there's no no evidence to suggest that it causes it, mm. and uh, the, the the select trial yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, the the it was not not significant enough to make that uh, make that uh, suggestion. Mm. Now if somebody tells me that I'm on fish oil, I don't get to a, uh, I probably say it's it's fine to continue mm. on that. But the problem is, uh, yesterday I had a patient come into my memory clinic with 13 different alternative medi medication, mm -hmm. just started for dementia. And, uh, and I don't know whether those tablets itself is causing his cognitive problem or not, because God knows what those uh, side effects are with, for this medication. So if, if somebody comes with alternate, uh, the um, other medications that, they, uh, that you are not familiar with, and I would probably advise them to at least stop a few and see what, what happens before you start them on an additional tablet on the, to stop of that. And uh, in a TIA patients, I had 23 tablets with over-the-counter medications on it. 
And all I did was not to add anything, stop all those. And you, amazed, I am sure you'll see these patients day in and out as how, how many patients. Because in problem with Alzheimer's disease is that, that there are only three or four drugs that we can play with. And therefore, when the, when the effect go, wears off after a few years, they naturally look for the alternate, but mm. you have to be very careful what they take. Mm. Fish oil is something that I recommend, I usually recommend them to take. I wouldn't stop that. Okay. That's my personal preference yeah. at least. What, one of the um, other presentations that happens in um, general practice, you get the people who present early, but you also get the people who present very late. And some uh -huh. of the presentations in rural settings can be quite challenging. Mm. You might get a very um, isolated and eccentric person who slowly appears to kind of be losing function, um, but they're very resistant to having um, any input uh, from services that are available. And, you know, mm. take in the country, they might be the, the nurse, the GP, um, maybe a visiting social worker if you're lucky. And I just wondered what your thoughts were about approaching um, elderly people who are in that situation, um, you know, where mm. you're aware that they're living in, you know, squalor, um, they might be not caring for themselves as well as, you know, they had been in the past. What What's your approach, especially if they're saying, I don't want that doctor coming to see me? You know, what should the GP do in, in that setting? Yeah, it's difficult. It's a challenge. It is a challenge, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Look, in ideal situations, at least from the service we provide from Toowoomba Hospital, it's just not me who provides that service. I've got, I'm being lucky to have Steve with me mm. and, and, a, and a good group of people who has, uh, who, who have a holistic approach to the patient. Now, if the patient is, a, if, if that person is adamant that he would not want to uh, want to be seen, uh, uh, go to Toowoomba to see a specialist, there are other ways we could probably still help that person. Mm. To be honest, if a person has gone into a end stage of dementia or advanced stage of dementia, most of the anticholinesterase medication, apart from some evidence for mermentine, uh, the rest of the medications are not that effective. And but still, providing them help with Alzheimer's Society and making that diagnosis is important. Providing that we sometimes provide, we got a geriatric nurse who can still visit this place uh, uh, with this person. And more often than not, it's not the patient who's actually distressed, it's the carer. And what help you could provide the carers is also important. And. Uh, and the compliance with these medications are also important. If somebody is not keen to come into a clinic, we have to really think of what we are going to achieve because I can start him on a medication, but if he's not, if he won't take it, and that's going to be the major if, issue. If the person is sort of socially isolated though, and um, are there um, ways that you can access um, care or treatment compulsorily for them? Uh, mm. Or That's do you have to wait until an accident happens and then services move in? No, we, we, right. we, we, we usually been proactive in that situation. Mm -hmm. As I said, we got facilities through our gas services mm -hmm. to, to enrich and we, and, and we get the social workers to, deal, to access as well. And if there are a carer who needs help, there's lots of information that we could provide with. Mm -hmm. And as Tim does for stroke, uh, we, I've got Becky who who deals with geriatric medicine as well. She's got lots of experience in such situations and all we need is a phone call to our services, geriatric services, and we will uh, we will aim to provide as much as help as we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the more, sorry, in the more okay. sort of rural areas, um, it depends on the degree of insight that that person has. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of picturing this person and perhaps there's no immediate carers nearby or living with a the person. There's nothing wrong with me, Doc. I don't need anything. Yeah, Just so, leave me alone. So <laughs> insight is poor. So, um, I mean, if, if in the case where someone has some insight and that their um, cognition is deteriorating and they're having trouble caring for themselves at home but still want to remain at home, um, you know, there are avenues for perhaps a, a, a community nursing um, service to uh, do an ACAT assessment, you know, they can organise an ACAT assessment and they can get a, a NHD package or something like that and uh, extended aged care at home package so that they can actually get some services um, to allow them to remain at home um, for as long as possible. Mm. The hard one is, well, when the person is refusing any help, 
and yet they clearly need help and there's no living carer. Yeah. Um, capacity also becomes an issue at that mm, point of time, yes, wouldn't it? Yeah. 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 Mm. And uh, it's easy to assess the capacity, but the, the difficult part is when somebody doesn't have the capacity, mm. but still how we get them into a safer mm. place if they don't want to. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's wonderful. I think we might just open it to the um, audience now because we're getting um, short on time, but were there any questions, burning questions in the studio audience? Um, Questions. One of them, what's CG, CJD? Oh, Kreutzfeld Jakob disease. Um, I don't know if you'd yeah, like to. Like the human mad cow? Or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a prion disease. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a group of prion diseases. And, uh, and there are several categories under that. And, uh, and the main category is the sporadic, where nobody knows what, why that comes up. It just turns up, and that's the 80%. Now, everybody thinks, and uh, the most common epidemic was this uh, mad cow disease. And actually, mad cow disease only uh, accounts for five to about 5% of CJD cases. And 80% uh, and are just sporadic cases. In fact, this one is I most, likely, say, to be, yeah, I mean, most likely to be a sporadic mm -hmm. one. And the one, two cases I've seen before are sporadic cases as well. Then the people are worried that uh, whether this is familial. And only about 5 to 10% are mm. familial. And, uh, and uh, the, there is also a variant of uh, uh, CJD, and uh, that is actually is the one that variant of CJD is the mad cow disease where you got it from uh, in the UK. There was a big, uh, and then there's also an atrogenic uh, component, which is uh, if you do a brain uh, surgery from a person who's had the disease, you could if you do it on another person on the brain, you could transmit that, that is less than 1%. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, when a, when a CJD comes in, all you will see is that the people get too excited, put him in a side room. Actually, you are dealing with less than 2% of those cases, and 98% 98, 98 of the time it's not uh, infective to anybody else, unless you put, a, put something in and then put it into your hair, which is very unlikely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would have written Critel yeah. Jacob, but I couldn't spell it, so I put yeah. CJD. Yeah. Um, um, actually, one, while I've got you all here, too, one, one little thing just, just for my um, interest, I guess, as a, as a registrar, and I guess a lot of other registrars probably have a similar question, is those people that come to you who are on, you know, have been on a, a, a cholinesterase inhibitor for two, three years or, or whatever, and let's say we are in a rural location where, you know, you're not just down the road and it may be a significant um, event to get them to you. Yeah. Is there a role for us then? I mean, when, when do you kind of go enough's enough or, gee, the dose needs to be increased or, or what, you know, what's the... Yeah, my, uh, the, the way I do it is that it's very important before you start the treatment to have a good session with the family. Okay. And it's also very important you do not start the tablet on your first appointment with that person. Uh, I don't think the, yeah. we can start it. It's specialist only, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah. is right. Yeah. But yeah. I think in the, in, the, in the months to and years to come, that might change. That might change because the drug is now going to come okay. out. Now, that conversation involves me saying that this is a drug that only slows down the progress, not actually arrests the progress. Mm. And it only works, in my experience, about, if you start on 10, it works on about five. And even if it works on five, some people have a benefit for about many years, some have it only for six months, mm. and some wouldn't have it at all. Mm -hmm. So if you start the tablet, for instance, if I'm starting on Aricept, I mm. start on a five milligrams of Aricept, and in about six weeks to, to, uh, to uh, six to eight weeks time, I see them again in the clinic to see what the response is. Mm. The response I ask is we do another MMSC mm. to see whether that's stable or it's getting okay. any better. Even if the MMSC is getting less, we ask the family, have you seen an improvement on okay. him? And if you, there's an improvement, we increase the dose and then review them in once in every six to 12 okay. months. And there will be a time in about one or two years time or maybe before or after, that the family would say that he was actually better for some time, now actually he's going down. Mm. Now, if you're on just uh, rivastigmine or donapazil mm. or in uh, uh, the, and this medication, then you can probably think of starting on mermantin on top of it, mm, okay. because mermantin is not a drug that you start uh, uh, to start off with, but you can add it on. Okay. 
and you can add it on by itself or on top of the uh, the cholinesterase mm -hmm. inhibitors. But there will be a time very soon, probably within the first two, three or four years time, that they will find that they are getting more side effects from that mm -hmm. drug and do not hesitate to stop that. Mm -hmm. And I would not, if, if I had started the medication and you see this patient five years down the line and you are seeing that the patient is now in a nursing home setting, and probably that drug has worn off the effect. And in fact, it's a rule of thumb, if somebody's in a nursing home who's, who's, who's needing all help, that we have gone beyond the benefit of okay. that acetylcholine esterase and you can stop it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the worst case I would do is you stop it for a few, few, few weeks and see, that better, see what happens. If he gets really worse Always. afterwards, you, the worst thing you could do is uh, you can start again. it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there, there is compelling evidence, especially in nursing homes. These patients were started on six, seven years ago, and just on that, without much benefit. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. That's been a very interesting discussion, very worthwhile. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank Stuart for your excellent you. case um, and presentation. And thank you to our specialist and expert panel as well for your very valuable um, contribution to tonight's discussion. So everyone, um, please thank our audience, um, our panel. Thank you.